my understanding of this new legislation that uh, you and Senator Sessions, uh, Schumer, Graham, Stabenow, and Burr have introduced um, is that our trade policy is so screwed up in the United States, we have no way to defend our domestic industries with tariffs like we used to have. And, and so now we're having to resort to using um, basically changing the value of our currency or complaining when other countries change the value of their currency to balance out trade. Do I have that right? Yeah, you basically have that right. That, that China, it's, that much of the world operates on what's called floating currency, where the, the currency is determined, the movement up and down, stronger dollar, weaker dollar, determined by um, sales of currency and, and, and mark the marketplace. In China, they've pegged their currency at a rate that makes their exports into the United States significantly cheaper and they um, makes U.S. exports to China um, more expensive. That means that that, um, the, that that's fundamentally the biggest reason that our uh, trade deficit with China has gone from about ten ten billion dollars when P and T R passed a decade and a half ago to three hundred some tr- uh, trillion today, uh, three hundred some billion today. So that um, and and. George Bush, the senior, once said that a billion dollars in trade deficit can can um, translate into as much as thirteen thousand jobs. So we know that that kind of trade deficit with China costs costs us a lot of jobs in our community. Do, do they peg their currency to another currency, or do they simply define its value and not allow it to float? Um, they peg it more often than not to other currencies, but they can adjust it pretty regularly. So, it, it, in, in some sense, it's it's. I mean, so it so it keeps them in that advantageous position, and it right. looks that the Japanese do. I mean, many many in East Asia have done it. And they they started by building their economy. Um, they're much weaker than ours economy um, by being an export driven economy, and you know that's fine for a while. But it, it, when you're when you have the economy the size of Japan and China, it just doesn't work for the world that way. It worked yeah. for them for at least a period of time. Yeah. Well, it worked for us for a while too. <laughs> it worked for us for a while. Yeah. I, or we, we aren't we aren't not guilty. We aren't innocent of this from several generations ago. We've always we practiced a very different kind of trade policy in the William McKinley days. We were very much that way sure. for hundred years ago. Yeah, Another, old, one of the great Ohio presidents, I might add. Yeah, the old gunboat. With Harding diplomacy. and Garfield and Hayes and Grant and all the, the pantheon of great presidents of this country. Wow. From the, from the state of Ohio. <laughs> yes, or something. Very impressive. Um, Sen- we're talking with Senator Sherrod Brown. What, what exactly does your bill suggest that we should be doing or, or the, the, demand that we be doing? The bill, the, right now, the law is the Department of Commerce can factor in a number of things when doing an investigation for an unfair trade practice. For instance, if the Chinese are dumping steel. Just a few months ago, we won a trade case with China on something called oil country tubular steel. They either, they're, the, they're the very high high um, strength steel that's used for drilling uh, gas and for gas and oil. Um, we won that case because China subsidized its steel, and the Department of Commerce found that. Unfortunately, it took, took over a year to make that, to come to that decision while China was selling a lot of steel into the United States. So the damage was there. But the Department of Commerce under our bill must consider currency, and they can make the determination on currency much more quickly than on these other factors when the investigation is long and deep and difficult to find out how these companies are sub- so these countries and their companies, often state-owned, sometimes not, are subsidizing their production. Well, if, this, if the scam that China is running is manipulating their currency so that their currency is cheaper, so that their exports are cheaper, and when we want to import into their country, it costs more, and so they're not going to buy our imports, or our exports, excuse me. Um, that seems to be something that really would touch every single thing made in China. Um, are we just going after Chinese-owned companies that are exporting to the United States, or is this going to go after things like you know Apple and Dell and all these well, other that's companies? A, that's, a, that's exactly the right question. You, you know, it, it, it's kind of I mean, you are you are an incredible his, uh, student of history. I mean, more than any show probably I've been on, you've thought and, and talked a lot about the sort of how we got from point from a hundred years ago to here. And one of the things that that's um, particularly notable, I think, in the last 20 years is U.S. companies have done something that, to my knowledge, has never been done in world economic history, and that is 
shut down production in Toledo and Dayton and Youngstown, Ohio, moved that production overseas, either subcontracted or continued the same company or the same company doing it, and then selling back into the United States. So our companies um, have our companies would be to do that would be affected by this. There's that's why a number of U.S. companies that have that have done moved a lot of their production to China to sell back into the U.S. Why a number of them don't like our currency bill because it will in fact affect their sales into the United States. But when our tax policy and trade policy encourages shutdown of production in Dayton and Manson Mansfield and Zanesville, and move overseas to sell back to Dayton and Mansfield and Zanesville. It's a pretty bankrupt and maybe corrupt policy that doesn't serve our communities. Well, and it's brutal to the working class in America. Yeah, and it's it's part of why wages have, have stagnated. You know, we we've seen fifty eight or nine months of job growth in this country, consecutive job growth. Um, and after 10 years of no job growth during the Bush years and the year after that, um, but we've still not seen wages go up. And a big part of that is the downward pressure on wages from moving production overseas. I mean, we're starting to see companies come back from China, but they're partly coming back because our wage structure has not um, is, 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 is less um, generous, let's say, than it was a generation ago. Yeah, well, and China is figuring out that they've got two problems. One, they've got a growing middle class that they have to deal with, and so wages are going up there. Right. And, and, in fact, they instituted a national health care program to, to accommodate that. And the other, the other is that they've got a horrible pollution problem, and they're starting to clean that up. Yeah. And both of those represent costs for American companies that have decided to relocate to China. Mm-hmm. Um, it, what... How do you? What do you see as the future of this piece of legislation? I mean, is this is this a a, a shot in the dark? Is this a you know a, a, an exclamation? Are you, are you making a point, or do you actually expect that, that you know? In particular, I'm concerned about the Republicans. They seem to shill for every big company that comes along, even if those big companies are in partnership with the communist dictators of, of China. An interesting statement and and pretty darn factual. Um, this is not a shot in the dark, and this isn't to make a point. This is to actually accomplish something. We're, we're saying our strategy is to the President of the United States and to um, anybody that's involved in this is, is we, 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 this Senate will refuse to pass fast-track trade authority or a p- p- trade promotion authority fast-track, or re- we will also refuse to pass the tr- Trans-Pacific Partnership unless currency, enforceable, strong currency standards are in the bill. Um, I don't know if that means I vote for these agreements even then, but I do know that a number of my colleagues will not vote for it, will join me in not voting for it if it's not part of it. If it is, um, some will vote for it, some will vote against it, but this is really a condition of support for a number of people in both parties, um, and we're operating under that assumption that we can hold on to them and force the, the White House ultimately and our trade negotiators to do this right. But A, China is not part of TPP, although they China want to. It's not part of TPP. That's why we want to pass the, the, the bill, freestanding bill, so that our Department of Commerce can engage this way with China, number one. Number two, if it's part of Trade Promotion Authority, um, it will apply to the next to, to the, um, the investment uh, agreement that, that the administration is negotiating now with China, um, so they would be affected then. Um, so we will kind of go on two or maybe three tracks here. Have you gotten any feedback from, from the Obama administration? Well, they this? don't like this. They, they compare it to the QE that the Federal Reserve has done, which is um, actually not, not comparable. We have, we have no... I don't think there's any evidence it's comparable, so it's not going to come back on us and hurt us. Um, but administrations have never really liked Congress telling them what they can negotiate and what they can't. The, the Congress always puts in what are called trade objectives um, in, in the trade negotiations and fast track, and they never mean anything. They're a wink and a nod by the negotiators to Congress's wishes, and they go do whatever they want and negotiate agreements that help corporate America and hurt workers. And those days have got to be over. Yeah. There's, uh, there's this you know, absolute wave of revulsion at the Trans-Pacific Partnership sweeping the country, both from people on the right who are hysterical about sovereignty and on the left who are concerned about the econo- well, economic sovereignty, you know, the impact of this. Um, can this be done in a way that's completely decoupled from that? Could be, um, it can be, but it's um, the the Congress is not 
necessarily looking at it the right way that way. I, I mean, one, one example is something called investor state, and we've talked about that on the show, I believe, before, where mm-hmm. where it used to be that a government would bring a case against another government um, for an unfair trade practice. Now a private company can bring a case against a foreign government. And what's happened and what, what we fear is that, as I mean, the, the best example perhaps is a U.S. tobacco company um, bringing a case against a new law in a Central American country, perhaps, that, or in, in an Asian country now under TPP, that has passed a public good, strong public health tobacco law, that they can bring a case saying that's an unfair trade practice or threaten that they will bring that case and that company then fails, that country fails then to um, just decides against passing a public health law. That's some of the most um, pernicious sides of this. 